We'll be looking at echocardiographic assessment of valve morphology and function today. A lot to cover. And uh, little time, we'll be looking at the structure and then also we'll try to quantify function. What I would like is a lot of interaction. Please stop me when there's something that you've not understood or we'd like to go over it again. Especially since I understand there are many um, new first year fellows joining us today. So a big welcome to all of them. Welcome to the exciting world of pediatric cardiology. Uh, we hope to cover some of these lesions today as I was telling Kavita, we might have to split this session into two since we have to um, exit at nine. So mitral valve prolapse and perforation, we'll look at mitral stenosis, we'll have a case of double orifice mitral valve, we'll also discuss rheumatic mitral valve. Then similarly, we have aortic stenosis, whether it's valvar, sub aortic membrane, supravalvar, and we'll also share a case of aortic regurgitation. We'll look at pulmonary pathology and end with tricuspid regurgitation. So we'll do this through echo clips, and I really would like a lot of discussion here. So please do stop me. This is the forum to learn. Here's a, a cartoon of the mitral valve. That's the aortic valve. So obviously this is anterior, this is posterior. So you've got the uh, anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. The posterior one has these little scallops. And if your atrial, left atrial appendage is here, the numbering starts from near the left atrial appendage, that's the left side, that's P1, P2, P3, while the opposite area, the P1 will be A1, A2, and A3 for P2 and P3 respectively. So this is how we describe the mitral valve. And here's a 3D freeze of the same thing. Remember in our parasonal short axis view, this view will be inverted. In your parasonal short axis, your left-hand side will be where your left atrial appendage is, so your A1 will actually be on that side of the screen, opposite to what it shows over here. Let's move on to this patient, the 10-year-old with craniosynostosis. Here is a parasternal long axis view. We are immediately attracted to how the mitral valve looks. Seems to be having extra chordae, seems to be having extra motion seems to be prolapsing, which means that the leaflet is moving above the line of the annulus. So the line of the annulus is from here, the hinge point to the posterior hinge point, and it's moving above. So this patient has mitral valve prolapse. So you, you can angle your transducer towards the aortic valve or tricuspid valve, and then look at selectively A1, P1 versus A3, P3. And here you're seeing prolapse even when you tilt towards the aortic valve. Here is a parasonal short axis view. That's the LV cavity. Here is the anterior leaflet. You see how bulky it is compared to the posterior leaflet. And you also see there is redundancy of the leaflet. Back to long axis here. Again, showing that, there's, uh, the, that the anterior leaflet, even the posterior leaflet is fleshy. the buckling of the A2, the mid-segment. That's how most commonly it's going to be for mitral valve prolapse. You're going to see fleshy leaflets, maybe both of them, maybe just one, a lot of redundancy, and the A2 segment. So remember, this is A1, this is the left side of the screen, A2 and then A3, and the A2 segment will show the maximum redundancy generally. Along with redundancy, redundancy of the leaflet, there also is elongation of cordae, which contribute to pathology. So color flow, remember to assess it around 60 to 70 centimeters per second Nyquist. If you go above and set it at 100, I mean the scale, then you run a risk of losing the yellow and um, under quantitating your MR. So very important, especially when you're trying to eyeball it and determine that you have your Nyquist set right. Please do interrupt me if there are questions. So you see, um, that um, the, the regurgitation is actually all around the opening where the anterior leaflet collapses with the posterior and especially around the A2. 
Kavita, we can keep the chat window open if there's uh, anybody with a question. Just a second. Uh, four chamber apical view, again showing that the leaflet is prolapsing into the left atrium. Uh, for us to diagnose mitral valve prolapse, it's important to see it in two views. So this one and the parasternal long is, is a good bet. You can't just see it over here and diagnose it as diagnose a person as having MVP. Also remember that things are not that simple that this is the anterior leaflet and that's the posterior leaflet. No, uh, not at all. It gets pretty complicated and depends on where exactly you are in, in the enteroposterior plane for your apical four chamber view. You could be very posterior and viewing most of the posterior leaflet. You could be very anterior and viewing more of the anterior leaflet. So in a typical four chamber, what we get, you get, you view some part of A2 and then you view some part of P1 and P3. So um, this you see the redundancy again. So here's uh, the color jet showing the jet which is posteriorly directed, very, very typical. And here it is in the apical four chamber view. Not a whole lot of regurgitation. We're eyeballing it, looking at the area, uh, looking at the vena contractor, which is the narrowest um, diameter of the jet of mitral regurgitation. And things are co quantified into mild, moderate, or severe stenosis dependent on the diameter of the vena contractor. But that's not the only thing. You can look at the area of the MR with respect to the area of the left atrium. So these are all very, very, very well standardized. And I think there's a 2014 update as well. So I urge all of you to look that um, ACC document up. There are European guidelines as well. And uh, post it up in your echo lab for easy reference. You don't have to buy hard the numbers. So like I said, one is the vena contractor width, one is the jet area with respect to the LA area. Now you can ask yourself, well, um, it appears so different in different views. Well, the thing is to grab the maximum possible regurgitation that you have and then use that. Look at the annulus, very, very important to measure it uh, accurately. Hint Hinge point to hinge point because you hopefully will be using these scores and then figuring out whether there's annular dilatation as well. Remember, the whole point of doing an echo is to figure out the management plan. And then if you have to take a patient to the OT, you should know whether the patient needs annular, annuloplasty or not, along with something for a long body in this case, for example. So do not skip any step. Here you see the mitral valve. Uh, analyst was much larger than tricuspid, but it's not enough just for that information. You need a Z score. You need to say, okay, so this is plus three and hence um, worthy of annular, uh, you know, tightening, annular tightening. You can also look at a CW spectral, you know, Doppler interrogation of the MR jet, and you can see how dense it is. If it's not very dense, that goes in favor of mild or moderate regurgitation. So we covered this. One other thing I've not mentioned, but we will cover in the subsequent patient is the importance of looking at the LV dimension. So this next patient is a two, three year old. Here is his, uh, this is actually a post-operative patient for chamber view. We don't like the way the interventricular septum is moving. Can't really see the mitral valve because we're not in the correct plane. Here is a you know, M mode grab. Just a minute, I'll move this down. Okay, that's better. It shows the EF is 55, so just get the you know lower limit of normal. And systolic volume is 30, which is okay. Remember to index it always. So if the body surface area is 0.5, automatically your end systolic volume becomes what? For for uh, for 0.5, it's 30. So for one, it's going to be double that. It's going to be 60. Here we're looking at the LA area. Here is a color flow. And you see regurgitation. You seem to see multiple jets of regurgitation. Okay. 
is one jet particularly little laterally situated, not central. That's uh, pretty huge. Here we are measuring function of the LV. This is by something called LV dp by dt, which is pressure change over time in the first one second of the. Um, you can in, you can use various things, but over here what we use is the mitral regurgitation signal. So normal LV dp dt value should be around 1200 or so. 1200 1300 is good. This patient has normal. Now remember when there's mitral regurgitation of any significant degree, then your function should be supranormal. Your DPDT value should be typically 1600, 1800. But they are not supranormal. And why should they be supranormal? Because your LV, instead of having to eject into the relatively higher resistance aortic, you know, aorta, it has an option of pumping into the low resistance my, uh, left atrium. So it, it, it is basically not having to work as hard and therefore squeezes extra and therefore your ES becomes, should be very high and should, and your DPDT should also be supranormal. Our EF in this case was low normal. Our DPDT is not in the range we want it to. So this is telling us, listen, we've crossed that bridge where it was supranormal at one time and now we're looking at something which is deteriorating. So this is how you time your intervention. Here is the parasternal long axis view. It's a different kind of regurgitation. Up to this, up till this point, we've not figured out why it is like that. Seems to be not at the coaptation point. Seems to be somewhere in the posterior leaflet. Pretty white jet of the vena contracta. Now here is a two chamber view got from the apex. We're trying to look at the whole thing in you know further detail. There's one central jet and one in the posterior leaflet. That's uh, you know PA pressure, which also helps you in determining acuity or chronicity of the mitral regurgitation. <clears throat> okay, so we're looking at vena contracta. Let's pause for a minute and look at this Carpentier classification that you can use for any kind of regurgitation. Well, actually mitral or tricuspid. And what it says is that there are three types. In the first type, um, which says here, the leaflet motion is normal, but either the annulus is dilated or there's a perforation in the leaflet. So in this particular case, actually there was a perforation which we picked up on transthoracic echo and the patient could be taken to the OT and it was successfully repaired. So that's type one. Type two is when there's excessive leaflet motion due to prolapse. And type three is when there is less leaflet motion. One example could be posterior leaflet is immobile, so there's not co no coaptation or the papillary muscles are displaced because the LV is so huge. That's the reason for the MR. So that's type three carpentier. I like this classification, even though I may not mention in the report, because it makes us think the, about the mechanism, forces us to think about the mechanism of the MR rather than just describing it, you know, um, whether qualitatively or quantitatively. So back to this patient. Here we've located the perforation, that extra thing in the posterior leaflet, and patient had a happy ending. Let's move on to another case. Now this little girl was an infant when we saw her first. We're trying to get a parasonal short axis view. So in the ideal one, this ventricular septum should be right here like this, but you know, in this patient it just wasn't obtainable. And what we see over here are instead of one big oval as the mitral valve orifice on fast, you're seeing two little eyes in there inside the LV. This is an example of double orifice mitral valve. Look out for it and you will see it. Probably in three, four years, you'll come across one such case. May or may not be a problem. In this particular case, it did create problems. So I'll just take you through some clips. That's the left ventricle. Mitral valve opening there. Overall, my, the mitral valve doesn't seem to be opening well. Our eyes are also drawn to the fact that the LA, left atrial area is larger than the right atrial. In common practice in normal people, the left atrial area and right atrial areas are 
approximately equal. So that comes that becomes very useful for us because we can immediately eyeball and say whether the LA is enlarged or not. Uh, I believe, uh, unlike the adults, where you know they talk about you know LA not all the time being able to dilate, compliance issues, and loss of elasticity, we you know our, our kids. I think the LA always dilates when it sees volume overload. So I think it's a good sign for us. I mean, I respect the mitral regurgitation if there's or mitral stenosis if there's LA enlargement. So here's a color. Uh, Doppler across the mitral valve. Again, just to remind you, the scale has to be set at around 60 70 centimeters per second. Otherwise, you will miss things or underdiagnose things. And you're starting to see that the turbulence originates somewhere around here. There's actually a supramitral membrane there as well. This is how it typically looks. You start to see turbulence originating somewhere at the near the base of the leaflets. Not here at the tips or the chordae level, but here. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is if we have identified a supramitral membrane, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back and stop over there. I have learned it the hard way. We should move on and make sure that the leaflet length is okay, that the chordal length is okay, that the papillary muscles are okay. In this particular case, there were lots of problems even in the Subleaflet apparatus. The chordae were short, the papillary muscles were not well formed, apart from the fact that this was a double orifice mitral valve. So, addressing just the supramitral membrane here did not do the trick. Here is another view showing the same, very nicely seen the turbulence originates at this, these little things going into the uh, inflow. This is the supramitral membrane. Obviously, what we will do is we will put a color Doppler signal across it and look at and trace the mean and then gauge the severity of mitral stenosis reported as mild, moderate, severe based on the mean gradient. This is a short axis view trying to get typical pictures of the mitral valve but no success. The papillary muscles are just too scattered and ill-formed. So here this patient had a mean gradient of 9. PA pressure was high, 60. Left atrium is enlarged. And look at this. You know, we talk about E and A waves. And we talk about how in the neonate and in the fetus it is okay for the A to be taller than the E, but not for the older infant. It has to go back to normal E taller than A. E is the early filling, you know, and A is the late filling, which occurs just at the P wave, just before the QRS. So over here, the A is a lot taller than the E, and this indicates diastolic dysfunction. Most of the filling should be in the E period, not in the A period. Okay, got more shots of those. Two orifices. We move forward. Let's move on to one more case of uh, rheumatic heart disease this time. This is a teenager starting with the parasternal short axis view, which is my favorite spot to begin, but each one has their own, and as long as they do all of the windows and only then come to a conclusion, it really doesn't matter. And the way I do it is do all the 2Ds first and then go back and do the color. That way you do enough justice to the um, anatomy rather than getting um, distracted by the color. So you're seeing a ventricle which looks dilated. It seems to be contracting really well. You've got a shortening fraction of 32, which is good. Ejection fraction of 60, which is good. You've got an end systolic volume of 58. Now, remember, this is an important number. The end systolic volume, um, we, 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 well, you know, like I said, the aim is to formulate a plan and time your intervention. So when your end systolic volume index is upwards of 55 ml, 
more than 55 ml per meter square, that's considered an indication for intervention. That means here, at the end of systole, also you're left with a significant amount of blood in the you know, left ventricle, and that should correlate with your left ventricular diastolic dimension. Here it's 5.5, very abnormal for this child actually. Also look at the and diastolic, uh, systolic dimension, 3.7, always get a Z score for those as well. Parasternal long axis view. Obviously, something is wrong. The leaflets look thickened, not skirting well. But this is an uh, just an initial clip, and we'll look at more. So that posterior leaflet hardly moves. See, in a parasternal long, it's okay to say this is the anterior leaflet and this is the posterior leaflet. But in apical four chamber, it's not okay to say anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet that way. So this is a typical rheumatic valve appearance, the rheumatic affliction of the mitral valve. There are Wilkins scores, and again, it's a good idea to stick this in your Echolab room so you don't have to memorize things. The Wilkins score looks at whether the valve is mobile, whether what part of the leaflet is thickened just at the base or even up to the tip, whether there's some cal echogenic spot denoting calcification, and whether even below the leaflets, whether there are chordal cordae which are thickened. So a mitral valve score of less than eight means if there's mitral stenosis, then your ballooning will work. So parasternal short axis view, you see the orifice uh, area appears smaller and you can go ahead and trace it out and it will spit out an area number that you can plug in in your table and find out whether it's mild, moderate or severe stenosis. Pretty simple to do. Here's a four chamber view, typical mitral affliction of rheumatic um, you know, heart. Humongously dilated left atrium. Look out for uh, um, echo, spontaneous echo contrast also over there. And here is a two chamber view the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet over here. I've got it labeled. And posterior leaflet hardly moves while the anterior moves uh, pretty all right. In fact, yeah, maybe one of the chordae might be ruptured. The tip seems to be moving a little extra. So there you go, the color Doppler. You've got mitral stenosis, mean gradient of 17, which is very high. So this is the typical appearance. There's MS and a whole lot of MR. The BMV isn't a good idea. You've got to show your eyes. Parasonal short axis view. It regurgitate inject really, really wide. Severe mitral regurgitation as well. Left atrial area we are taking. So people even measure the at the level of the leaflets the diameter there, and that also can be plugged into the table to find out where you are with regard to your severity. You know, for example, you know, don't don't just rely on one number. Your let's say mean gradient is less for whatever reason, maybe because your LV EDP is very high, then that's when other things like this help. The planimetry um, area or something like this, the low, narrowest diameter there at the level of the leaflets. Looking at the mitral valve inflow signal, and here is the outflow signal. So see how, uh, I'm not, not outflow, sorry. This is again across the mitral inflow, but the regurgitant, the MR signal, very, very dense. So goes in favor of severe mitral regurgitation. We can also use um, pressure half time, draw a line from the tip, and extend it down, and follow the curve, and that will give you a pressure half time and the machine will calculate out the mitral valve area from that, it's a formula. 
there are some ifs and buts, so you got to read it before you start applying. Showing you the inflow intensity versus the regurgitant jet intensity. So very, very you know, similar, indicating severe mitral regurgitation. So DPDT, if you all remember, DPDT 12-12 mmHg per second is normal, but what we want is for it to be higher. Okay, so we're doing good in terms of time. I'll just move on to the next one that I have. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. It is part two. What's that? Oh, it's this one. All right, all right. Got it. Part one, part two. All right, here I see it. So we go to full screen. You know, what I haven't done today is I have not included um, post lecture questions, but I will, I will, uh, you know, when Kavita asks me, I shall certainly post some questions derived from this. So I do wish, you know, you all would be more participative. This is, okay, I've got a question after all that content, that's good. How much AML should prolapse to label? So the thing is this, the thing is this, the question is how much of the AML should prolapse to label it as pro, uh, MVP? That's the question. It's a great question. Now for the adults, it's easy. They say, okay, so if it prolapses more than two mm above the annular line, you can diagnose it as a prolapse. But you know, for us that two mm may not be true. I mean, what I would like is, for you to incorporate a lot of things when you put an MVS, MVP as your diagnosis. So the appearance of the leaflet, then the fact that it should prolapse in two views, I think is very, very important. The way it moves in parasternal short axis. So pay attention to all of that, and only when all those things are positive, then go ahead and label it as MVP. A lot of patients come in to us where adult echocardiologists have uh, done the echo labeled as MVP and we reverse it. And it's not just a simple thing as, okay, so this is no, not MVP and it, nothing changes. It's a humongous thing for the parent now to be told your child does not have a heart disease. Otherwise, the child gets labeled with a heart disease, is kept off sports and uh, altogether undesirable things happen. So do keep that in mind. We'll move on to the uh, next some cases. We've got 20 minutes. The next is a common situation that we encounter, which is aortic valve stenosis. This patient is a five or six year old boy. And as you're aware, my uh, aortic stenosis is the most common CHD. Uh, bicuspid aortic valve is the most common CHD. Not aortic stenosis, so. Here is the parasternal short axis view. What do we see? We see the aortic valve right in the center. And what we should normally be seeing, the Mercedes-Benz sign. We do not see. What catches our eye is that the cusp margins appear thickened. They are more whiter, which means echogenic. And also, the, the cusp is not opening like, the cusps are not opening like they're supposed to. Normally when the aortic valve opens and you can do it in the next patient you echo, you freeze and you scroll back and you see how the valve opens and closes. It opens such that none of the cusps are visible. Here this is not happening. Here in the cardiac cycle, continuously throughout the cycle, you can see the cusps. Not only that, you can pay attention to what is happening here at the nine o'clock line. This is actually fusion of these two commissures. Now, how do you tell which commissure is which? In a parasternal short axis view, the one against the atrial septum is the non-coronary. This then, because this is the right side, becomes the right coronary, and that's the left coronary cusp. So going back, we've got what we have here is fusion of the right and the non-coronary cusp. This left cusp is okay. So the orifice shape is elliptical. The 
Now this aortic valve, this is a, you know this is a functionally bicuspid aortic valve. It happens in 30% of times, and this is worse than the other subset, which happens the remaining you know 70%, which is fusion of the right and the left cusp, where that elliptical orifice is not oriented at 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, but rather at 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock. The fish mouth that we see. So those valves tend to be a little better. So when I see such patients, you know, refer for murmur, and if I see the common variety, I'm a little bit more, more optimistic because obviously you know that this means lifetime uh, follow up. All right, so let's move on. Here's a parasternal long axis view. So even if you've started this view, uh, with this view, you've not seen the short, even then it strikes you in this view that the cusp is abnormal. It's thick and not only that, it's not moving properly. It's not flattening out against the ascending aorta. It remains in the LVOT. There you see it better over here, especially this cusp right here is thicker. Now, if you ask me which cusp is this, well, you can answer that question yourself. Slowly rotate your transducer to get back to the short axis and see what that corresponds to. It might be the RCC, it might be the NCC, depends on how your slice is of long axis. So usually ask that question, but answer it yourself also. So we are seeing some turbulence there. Also a little bit of regurgitation, very, very trivial. We get an M mode measurement. Uh, very important also is to see if there's wall hypertrophy. And obviously I have just some selected clips to view and we're looking at a suprasternal view long axis with the uh, Doppler aligned across the ascending aorta and the aortic valve over there. Now this particular view will give you, give you generally the best estimate of aortic stenosis. So whatever you get in apical 4, uh, most of the time you'll get a higher number because your, jet, you know, your Doppler will be better aligned in the suprasternal long axis. So you can go ahead and you can trace it and give out a report, a mean and a maximum value. Now what happens is that the maximum value that we get on echo, it says here 60 gradient maximum, is uh, compared with the CAT numbers because CAT is gold standard. And the echo mostly overestimates, it overestimates because it doesn't do a peak to peak difference like we do in CAT. It gives a peak instantaneous difference. You need to read a little bit about it, and it, it, you need you, it needs to register that the max on echo is overestimated, and what is more um, correlating with the um, cat gradient is the mean number, which is why we always trace out the mean number. So here it's 29. If you look at the recommendations, they say oh mean of 29 puts you in the moderate territory. But again, I'll warn you against using just that to determine uh, how severe things are. You know, uh, you know, 20 is the cutoff now. Earlier it used to be 25 to differentiate between mild and moderate. And, to, you know, where is 25 and where is 29? And what is to say that if I take this 10 times that I'll get different number, maybe I'll get a 25 as well. And, you know, I can debate with you and say, oh, well, this is actually an overestimation. All in all, I'm trying to tell you is, that of course get your numbers, but uh, but look at the whole picture, including the sim clinical symptoms and the ECG. And most importantly, maintain a follow up. Develop a rapport with your patient and ensure that they come for follow up so that you have serial measurements that you can compare. Those are invaluable, not just an isolated number. Okay, let's move on to the next. This is a little baby we saw. Came in in distress, I think. So here's a parasternal short axis view. The LV is very poorly moving. Here you see um, hardly any difference in the LVIDD and LVIDS. So EF is poor. The left ventricle looks globular. And there's some problem here at the aortic valve. We are focusing on it, and guess what? The cusps are doming. 
and that's the problem. This Bachu has valvar aortic stenosis. Here's a parasternal short axis view. Uh, not good quality, I'm afraid. But the cusps are thickened. We call them dysplastic. And we try and make out whether it's a bicuspid valve or a unicuspid valve. So um, what they say, you know, a toilet seat morphology. So those are really bad ones. Bicuspid ones are better. Here's an apical four-chamber view showing the poor function. Oh, here's the color. But you know, the aortic stenosis, this whatever area we are seeing within isn't very bad. But you've got to make sure you're not too high above into the ascending aorta where blood will fill up. You should be just at the right level. Okay, so we are going to the suppressed journal. And here, obviously, it will be the red that you record is, you know, the aortic valve shooting out blood. Is a jet, and we are getting a peak and a mean gradient. So it says peak of 62 and mean of, uh, you know, maybe I think 25 or 30. So do we go ahead and conclude, well, 25, well, maybe it's mild to moderate. So how about we monitor? Obviously not. We take into consideration that the left ventricular function is very poor, and in spite of being poor, it's able to generate this amount of a maximum gradient, and we respect it, and we take the child up for ballooning. Let's move on to a patient with a subaortic membrane. This was a, I think, 11, 12-year-old patient. Here is the parasternal, um, excuse me, apical four-chamber view. You can see the left, uh, the, the atrial septum going into the right atrium. The left atrium is enlarged. We are not happy with the function. The LV also looks enlarged. So we are concentrating on the aortic valve. There it is, opening and closing. So this is a case of a subaortic membrane. That's the aortic valve cusp there. Below the cusp, or you see proximal to the cusp, is actually a membrane there, a subaortic membrane. On the medial side, which means towards the mitral valve, it does appear that the membrane is closer to the aortic cusp. Now, all this has to be examined very carefully and reported and conveyed to the surgical team because then we make a plan of either attempting to strip off the membrane, which has to be done through the aortic valve, or we think of putting in a new valve because if the membrane is very adhering to the cusp, how do we think we're going to be able to strip it out successfully? So it's nice when there's some 2-3 mm difference, uh, a gap between the cusp and the membrane. So here you see it well. There's the little membrane there. It's fibrous. It seems to be circumferential. Sometimes it's just from one side, uh, you know, just coming from the ventricular septal aspect where we call it a spur sometimes when there isn't a matching mitral valve side count counterpart. And then we get into, like I said, measuring how far it is from the cusp and determining whether it's adhering to any cusp. Look at that. Look at the amount of regurgitation here. This blue jet. The vena contracta is wide. To assess aortic regurgitation, we actually compare this diameter to the diameter of the LVOT. Plug it in the table and it will help you figure out whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. Similarly, the length of the jet, whether the jet is just close to the cusp or extends into the LVOT or extends to the mitral leaflet or goes well into the LV cavity will also help you decide severity of aortic stenosis. Uh, regurgitation, sorry. As will the density of the aortic regurgitation signal on spectral Doppler. Obviously, there is inflow, uh, outflow gradient as well. There's aortic stenosis. Very poor function. Here's a short axis view. You can see this 
cusp, the, the non-coronary cusp appears thickened. The left one isn't moving well at all. So maybe that's the one adhering to the membrane and that's why it isn't able to move as much. All this needs to be examined in detail. You've got a max gradient of 50, mean of 30. Obviously, it has to be respected because this is in the face of poor LV function. We are measuring out the aortic analysis, measuring out to see how the ascending aorta is. And here's the last shot. Okay. Moving on to probably this is the last one we could do today. Supravalvar aortic stenosis. So this was a dysmorphic uh, looking child who came to us. Does anyone know which syndrome is associated with supravalvar aortic stenosis? Well, you all can think while we go through this. Oh, somebody said, Dr. Amit said William, and which is correct. So the next question is, which chromosome is affected? Does anyone know which chromosome? Think about it. And the subsequent question is, which test will you do to pick, figure out the abnormality in the chromosome? All right, so here is a short axis view showing us the aortic valve in the center. Looks pretty all right to me. Here we go, and you know, Somebody said 15, which is wrong. So look at the parasternal long axis view. You're seeing the cusps. Um, they're opening. And what we aim to achieve in parasternal long axis is to have the LV laid out across your sector and to visualize enough of the ascending iota. Somebody said 7 and 7 is right. And which test will you do? 7Q11 is the absolutely correct answer. Which test will you do to pick up this abnormality? Um, so what we what we tried and tried was to open up the ascending aorta, but each time we failed, and this patient had supravalvar aortic stenosis. The thing narrows down. Fish, fish is correct. So supravalvar aortic stenosis seen commonly in William. Can anyone tell me the correlation is any between hyperlipidemia and supravalvar aortic stenosis? While we look at these pictures, so looking at color flow across the aortic valve, there's no turbulence. They are telling you that the valve is good. So my question was, is there any correlation between supravalvar aortic stenosis and hyperlipidemia? And we are trying to image the aorta, and we are successful. It looks kind of narrow, and there's turbulence over there. So the problem is the ST junction. Obviously, the problem is the wall of the aorta, which is not normal. There's a problem there with the connective tissue, and uh, that needs something done. So this patient underwent a corrective surgery. Technique our surgeons employed was the BROMS technique. You mix it set three on all the three cusps and do a kind of a symmetric repair versus just splitting one side of the, of the aorta. All right, so familial hypercholesterolemia is what I asked. What is the link between familial hypercholesterolemia and supravalvar aortic stenosis? That's the question. How do you tie the two together, or do you? So look at this. We are, uh, you know, as is our protocol, doing a color Doppler of the descending aorta, and there is flow reversal there. There is also, look, look at how in the ascending aorta, there is turbulence. Okay. Kavita, do we have more time? Two minutes. I don't want to start another case with just two minutes in hand. So actually, I'm going to pause here and wait for questions. So anybody, hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia linked with supravalvar aortic stenosis? 
So the link is this, that if there is a homozygous uh, variant of the hyperlipidemia, you're going to have very, very high cholesterol and LDL levels, and you're going to be depositing uh, plaques everywhere, including in the supravalvular area. So we had one such case. We had a girl show up with chest pain, and she was diagnosed elsewhere with supravalvar aortic stenosis. Uh, right enough, we echoed her, and we saw um, the supravalvar area, which was narrow. We got a peak gradient of 30. The LB function was good. It just wasn't adding up. And this person had been worked up for fish, which was negative. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we try not to jump to conclusions before doing, you know, the entire procedure, which is inclusive of physical exam. And this is where we saw that there were stigmata of hyperlipidemia. There were cholesterol deposits on the skin. And uh, sure enough, it was uh, homozygous hyperlipidemia. And she had chest pain, not obviously because of the supravalvar AS but because of a big plaque sitting in her left main coronary artery. She was subsequently, um, she underwent stenting with a biodegradable stent. So any questions there with whatever we've covered so far? We have a couple more minutes. So it'll be nice if you have something that you would like to see again or discuss. Dr. Bhadra is sitting with me here. Anything that we should cover, Dr. Bhadra? In what we've covered so far? Any more nudges? I was going to take you through the take-home message at the end of the entire presentation, but I'll share um, my thoughts on this even today. First is take your time when you are dealing with valve uh, pathology and complete your entire echo and only then come to any conclusion. Like I said, don't just stop at supramitral membrane. Look at things more distally also. Look for the entire Schoen's complex, for example. Uh, th uh, second thing is don't just rely on one parameter. Yes, you know, this is a gray area quantification. What I call as mild plus might be moderate according to you. But your um, your defense of what you're labeling, it will be strengthened if you have uh, some quantifiable information. And not only against me, but to do, do justice to your patient, serially when you see the patient, you yourself will be stronger, you know, however you choose to label it. Um, it's very, very important that you don't start practicing all of these things when you get a patient. Try and do it on each and every patient, you know, even the next normal study that you do. Only then things will be reflex and beautiful and smooth when you do it on your uh, patients with valve pathology. So I'm going to stop here because it's 9 o'clock and it's a working day for all of us. And I hope um, we'll get a slot allotted to cover the remaining. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.